We have been in this impromptu season we have entitled Get Up. And it happened um, just by the way of the Holy Spirit because we said together, hey, it's March and March is a really hard month of ministry with spring breaks and everything in between. And now Easter is our last Sunday. So let's just go and see where the Holy Spirit leads us. And we started with Elijah who had his pinnacle ministry moment at the top of Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, comes down, Jezebel threatens his life. He's He's depressed, he's suicidal, he's ready to end it all, and God meets him, and when God meets him, God tells him to get up. Get up. He says, get up. He provides for him, feeds him, calls him to journey, and supports him. Then we move to Samuel. Samuel had his pinnacle ministry moment destroyed the day Saul imploded. Samuel's the prophet. God has called him to anoint the next king. He does this big ceremonious thing where he brings Saul out. And Saul is big and he's strong and he's impressive. And Samuel anoints him. And that was like his pinnacle ministry moment. And then Saul absolutely implodes. Saul falls apart psychologically, spiritually, relationally, and the next thing you know, God is saying, I wished I never made him king, and Samuel is mourning. He's crying, he's upset, he's going back to Ramah, he's going back to mom and dad's house. Why? Because his greatest moment in ministry has gone up in flames before him and God meets him and God asks him a question. How long will you mourn for what I've rejected? How long are you going to stay stuck in the past when I have a future for you? How long are you going to dream about what could have been when I've got what's still to be right in front of you? God asks him, how long? And then he says, get your anointing oil, get up and go. I've got a new one for you. He anoints David. We move to David. What does David do? David has an affair with Bathsheba, covers it up with murder, has a baby as part of that affair, and his, the consequences of his sin are going to cost him that baby who is sick and ill, and David is depressed. He's not eating. He's mourning. He's laying flat on the ground. He's not going anywhere. His advisors are coming to him, and they're saying, what, what are we, we going to do? Like He's one notch away from losing it, right? He's totally gone, and then the baby passes away. They're afraid to go to David, and they're afraid to tell him. David finds out anyways. And what is the first thing David does when he finds out? He, he, gets, up. he gets up. He gets up. He changes his clothes. He takes off the mourning outfit and he leaves the identity of mourning in that past season. He washes himself. He goes to the temple and he worships. And after he worships, he takes his pain and he points it to progress into a new season, which leads us to Today, we're going to close out, get up, and we're going to introduce this new season of Eyewitness, a journey through the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to do it in one message, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to leave one, enter into another, and be ready for the next 10 weeks. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Here's what I, 10 weeks, right? You're like, that's longer than my semester, right? We're, we're going in, right? But here's, here's what I need. I need five minutes of focus. Five minutes of focus. Zach told me it was 15 minutes of focus. A preacher's five minutes of focus, right? Five minutes because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to walk you through the history of John Mark. And if you don't grasp that, nothing today in the message is going to land and nothing over the next 10 weeks is going to land as it should because we can read the words of the man. But if we don't understand the man, the words don't land. Woo! That just happened. Don't get me freestyling up here. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Yeah. Acts 1 verse 8. Jesus comes and he says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will become my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2, we just sang about it. Holy Spirit falls in the form of fire. They are ignited with passion, with life. They're praying and speaking in other tongues. The gospel is going out to 14 different tribes in one area, and the church explodes. The church launches. Peter preaches at Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved, and God does exactly what he said. Upon this rock, I will build my church. 
Peter becomes the launching pad for the church. Peter now, up until Acts chapter 15, is the man. He is the centerpiece of the move of God that has become this spirit-filled movement we call the church. And so Peter is preaching. Peter is standing up to ungodly opposition. Peter is challenging ungodly government. Peter is arrested. Peter's a prison. He gets out of prison. He's continuing this fight. And in the midst of continuing this fight, something happens in Acts chapter 12. James gets arrested by Herod. Herod. Herod decides to publicly execute James. When he does, he recognized, hey, Jewish people kind of like that one. Might as well do it again. So then he arrests Peter, and he's going to execute Peter publicly. So the church gathers, and the church begins to pray. I'll pick up the narrative, Acts 12, 1 through 5. It says, about that time, King Herod Agrippa <clears throat> began to persecute some believers in the church, he had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with the sword. I, I just walked you through that one. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This put, took place during the Passover celebration. What a blow to the Passover, right? Like, that's, like a, that's like me getting arrested on Easter, right? Like Peter is arrested on Passover. I'm going to try not to, but there's no promises, right? I can get really upset on the road sometimes. Here we go. Verse, I'm just kidding. Verse 4. Then he imprisoned him. He's imprisoned Peter, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers. So he's got four soldiers surrounding him. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly. This is, this is our setup to our main character. So you've got Peter, who's the centerpiece of the church. He's preaching. God is moving. He gets arrested. He's going to be executed in front of everyone. And the church gathers in this house, and they're praying, and they're fasting, and they're believing God to set Peter free. He is their leader at this point, and they're praying, God, set Peter free. God, move with Peter. Now, we're going to see uh, whose house that was, okay? Let's move to Acts 12, verse 12. Here's what happens. God hears their prayers. He sends an angel who goes into that prison, releases the shackles. Peter shackled one arm and each arm to these prison guards. He wakes Peter up and he says, Peter, get up and go. Peter is so bewildered by what's happening, he thinks it's like a dream or a vision. When he finally realizes it's real life and an angel came and set him free, this is what happens. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. When he realized this, this is Peter. He went to the home of Mary, the mother of who? You got to look there. You got to look there. The mother of John Mark. What does it say? Where many were gathered in prayer. That's the introduction to our main character. Who is John Mark? John Mark is this little boy who grew up in the living room of the church where his mom was gathering the church and they were praying where Peter is arrested and when Peter's arrested they have this prayer meeting and there's this young boy named John Mark who's getting to sit in that living room I'm, I'm just looking at Elijah and looking at you and I'm thinking this is it he's sitting in the living room he's part of the prayer meeting he sees the church gathered they're praying for a miracle Miracle. They're praying that God would move in power and might. And then what happens? God moves. He hears the prayers. He answers their prayers. He releases the shackles. Peter walks out. And where does he go? To the house. And he knocks on the door. And they answer the door. And if you read through the narrative, they're so caught off guard that it's Peter. They shut the door and run back and get the church leaders. They, oh, they're like, man, we're praying for Peter. We're believing God for Peter. You hear that knock? Let's open the door. Peter? Hey, I think Peter's out there. They're like, well, let him in. Welcome him in. This is John Mark, a PK, a pastor's kid, growing up in a home of miracles, growing up in a home of prayer, growing up in a home of God moving. As Peter arrives at John Mark's mom's home, Paul and Barnabas are arriving back from a mission to the Gentiles, and they arrive in Jerusalem at the same time. Barnabas is John Mark's cousin. 
So Paul, it's this beautiful reunion of like the pillars of the faith. There's also this change of hands, right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of earth. Peter has done Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Paul is the man who takes it to Rome, to the ends of the earth, right? So there's this changing of hands, and Paul is rising up, and there's a huge support behind Paul, and he's got Barnabas with him, and he does his work in Jerusalem, and then he's ready to go back towards the Gentiles. And when he does, there is Barnabas raised up, and he says, hey, we need an assistant. What if we invite John Mark to come with us? Let's invite that young boy who's been a part of the prayer meetings, that young boy who's following Peter around, who's listening to the sermons. He, he has to have some ministry potential. He happens to be my cousin. Let's invite him along. So they leave on the mission journey, and Paul and Barnabas bring John Mark with them. I'll give you the two passages. That's in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Oh, no, Acts chapter 12, verse 25. I always get ahead of my notes. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, you got it, they returned, taking John Mark with them. Acts 13, verse 5. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. Who? John Mark went with them as their assistant. So now we have John Mark He is journeying. I told you five. We're coming up on 10. Just stick with me. We're almost there. So John Mark is going and he's journeying with Paul and Barnabas and he's on this mission with Paul and Barnabas and right after this, Paul faces massive persecution. He confronts a sorcerer. He's threatened to be imprisoned. They're threatening his life day after day. They want to kill him. Ministry is absolutely atrocious. It's vicious. It is violent where Paul is at. And in the middle of this, John Mark experiences and something happens. Acts 13 verse 13. Paul and his companions left for Paphos by ship from Pan- or for Pamphylia, landing at the point at the port to- the- blah, 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 blah. landing at the port town of Perga. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Did you catch that? He left. He's not even steps into his ministry journey and he's bailing. He's not even, he hasn't even made it to the first destination and he's saying, I can't do this anymore. This is not for me. I'm, this is what he's dreamed of. This is the little boy growing up in the home of the prayer meeting where Peter showed up after God did a miracle, invited on a missionary journey with the apostle Paul and he goes and within steps of it he fails. Within steps of it, he realizes, I don't have what it takes to do this. So he goes back to Jerusalem. Two years goes by. At the end of two years, Paul and Barnabas decide to make another loop. They're like, hey, let's pass back through Jerusalem, check on the churches again. And when they do, Barnabas comes up with the idea. He's like, hey, what do you think about bringing John Mark with us again? And Paul, here, I'll just read you the story. Acts 15, 36 through 40. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Verse 37, Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Here it is. But Paul disagreed strongly. That word strongly is a violent term in the Greek. In other words, Paul is saying, you bring him along and I'm gonna bust you in the mouth. He is not coming with me. Violently disagrees. Continuing on. But Paul, verse 38. But Barnabas agreed we wanted to take John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had, circle the word, deserted them. That is a humiliating Greek term. That is a term that they used for when a soldier bailed on fellow soldiers at war. In other words, Paul is saying, there is no way I am bringing that coward, turncoat, runaway, whatever you want to call it, there's no way I'm bringing him with me. There is no, the guy's a coward, he ran away, he abandoned us, he left us, there is absolutely no way. Paul was so strong on this, verse 39, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Think about this. 
Paul and Barnabas, the dynamic duo, these guys spent years of ministry traveling, doing a work of God together, making an incredible impact, and they were so strongly in disagreement with this that Paul said, it is him or me. It's him or me, but I'm not journeying with this guy anymore. I'm done with it. Let him be yours. So that's exactly what they did. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. Verse 40, Paul chose Silas and he left the believers and trusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Wow. How do you come back from that? How do you come back from the Apostle Paul calling you a coward? How do you come back from the Apostle Paul publicly labeling you as someone who bails on fellow troops? How do you, maybe you're in here and you connect with that. Maybe, maybe you've walked that walk of John Mark. Maybe for you, you decide, man, I'm going to go into ministry and I'm going to be in ministry and you spent a couple weeks as a youth pastor and it did not work out. Maybe you've walked that way in your relationships. Maybe you were previously married and you were off into marriage and after a few months, the whole marriage fell apart and you found yourself like John Mark walking back home under the shame and the guilt and the labels of people as someone who couldn't make it work or couldn't, couldn't overcome or someone who failed or someone who bailed on family or bailed on spouse or did these things. How, do you, how on earth do you come back from that? Little intermission of a, I think we need a story. We need a story, right? It's getting a little warm in here. Um, my son, so I'm not a big video games guy at, at all. I, I don't play a lot of video games. However, I have an eight-year-old son who has a Nintendo Switch. And yeah, right? And I mean, it kind of looked fun, right? He came to me and he said, hey, um, I want a football game. So I got him a football game. I got him Retro Bowl. Any Retro Bowl fans? Retro Bowl? Man, I just must be old and uncool. I thought for sure I'd have a couple in the 11. Okay, well, Retro Bowl is a football game where you're the manager of a football team. And so we're, he's got Retro Bowl, and it, it's looking really cool. And he left his switch out one night, and I was looking to decompress. And I was like, hey, I'm going to start playing Retro Bowl. So I start playing Retro Bowl, and 20 seasons in, I'm the best player there is on Retro Bowl right? I'm just killing it when it comes to Retro Bowl. And I got one season going and I'm 16 and 0 and I want to go undefeated and I want to win the Super Bowl. I want to just conquer the game, right? So I'm playing and I, I mean, it was, Kanan sits with me. He loves to watch me play. We take turns playing games and, you know, we call it getting tutties. You want to get some tutties? Let's get some touchdowns together. Right? And he sits with me and we're, we're playing this game and I'm playing and I'm 16 and 0 and I'm losing. It's the, it's, the, it's the end of the fourth quarter and as it's coming along, I am driving the field. I'm about to to score. I'm like Pat Mahomes about to rescue another game in the bottom, in the end of the fourth. And then all of a sudden I, I Dak Prescott the whole thing away. I just throw an interception. And when I do it, it, they get the ball. I'm about to lose. The clock is ticking down. And as it's ticking down, I'm like, no, I can't lose my undefeated season. So I hit the home button and I, I hit, the, hit the top button and it brings up closed software and I close the software. And then I reopen it. And I reopen the game and I click continue and I'm 16 and 0 and I'm playing the New England Patriots again. And Canaan looks at me and he says, well, well, dad, 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 what did you just do? And I said, what, what do you mean? What did I just do? No, no what, like you, you, you were supposed to lose dad, but you like, what did you, dad, you can't do that. And I'm like, dude, this family only has one preacher and you ain't it, right? <laughs> I, I do not need a lesson on integrity right now. I'm trying to go undefeated in Retro Bowl, son. Like, just chill. With the, and he's like, he's lecturing me, right? He is like, no, 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 dad. Like, you need to understand something. He's like, it, it is, it's okay if you lose a game, but dad, it's, it's not okay if you quit when you're losing. Right? I know. I'm like, find myself repenting to my eight-year-old. I'm like, I will never do that again. And if I do, I'll give you back your switch and I won't play anymore, right? <laughs> but this is, family, this is where we've been. This is what we've been talking about, right? You're going to take a loss. It's gonna happen. We are sinful people with a sinful nature in a sinful world and nobody is perfect. The difference is this. You cannot quit when you lose, We've been here. Why do, we, why do we celebrate Elijah? 
Because he took a loss and came back. Why are we celebrating Samuel? Because he took a loss and came back. Why do we celebrate David? Talk about a man who took loss after loss, yet become a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he took a loss but didn't quit. Why do we celebrate Peter? Because he denied Jesus and then launched the church. Why are we going to fall in love with John Mark? Because he was a coward. He was a deserter. He ran away. Not my words, the words of Paul. He completely abandoned the mission. Yet God uses him. Why? Because he took a loss and didn't quit. Why do we mock the children of Israel in captivity? Because they just kept losing. They just kept losing. Why is Judas Judas? Because he took a loss and gave up. Suicide at the end. He's over. Right? Why, why do we walk in these journeys of faith and learn? We're wrapping our minds around how do you come back after the Apostle Paul calls you a deserter, an incredibly derogatory term. We're going to jump into it. John Mark, all right, that was a little more than 15 minutes. Give me 10 more. Here we go to the end. How do you come back from this? It will be 30. Yes, it will be. How do you come back from this? Number one, this. John Mark didn't allow failure to define his faith. John Mark was unwilling to allow failure to define his faith. Listen to this. Here's your spoiler for how this whole story ends. Ten years later, the Apostle Paul writes the book of Colossians. And here's what he writes. Colossians 4, 10 through 11. Aristarchus, who is in, who's in my prison with me, sends you his greetings. And so does who? Mark, Barnabas' cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Hang on, do you, do you is it just me? Like, do you catch what's happening here? Ten years later, Paul is saying, hey, I'm together with John Mark, and if he comes your way, welcome him. Listen to how Paul describes him. Jesus, the one we call Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my coworkers. They are working with me here for the kingdom of God. Hang on a second. What did he just call John Mark? Coworker, co laborer, co journeyer. It gets even better. In the book of Philemon, Philemon 23 through 24. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my what? He says it again. Co workers, my co journeyers, my co laborers in ministry. 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. Paul's at the end of his life. And as his life is coming to an end, he's writing this final letter from his imprisonment in Rome. And I want you to listen to the only people he wants by his bedside. 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark. That is amazing. That is amazing. 20 years after calling him a coward and a deserter, He's saying, I'm going away. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark when you come. For he will be helpful to me in my ministry. How do you go from quitter to coworker? How do you go from useless to helpful? You don't allow your first failure to define your faith. How do you go from someone who Paul is saying, no, 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 not that brother. He comes along and I'm out. I'm finished. I've got nothing to do with this. Two, I'm passing away. My life is being poured out as a drink offering. I only have Luke with me and I want one more person. Bring me Mark. Somewhere along the way, Mark decided not to allow his first failure to define the rest of his faith. There was a sports psychology journal that did a study on low probability aversion. 
It was really interesting. They took a group of basketball players and they wanted them to make a corner three. They took them all and they said, we want you to make this corner three. They divided the group in half, all very similar skill level. And they said, you guys only get one shot and we need you to make this corner three. So they set him there and they, they had him shoot and they tracked the probability. And they're like, only one shot to do it. The next group, they took them and they said, you guys, we need you to make this corner three, but you get as many shots as it takes. The group that had more shots, more opportunities, performed 30% better on their first shot than those who were only given one shot. Here was the conclusion of the study. They said the participants whose first shot didn't define the rest of their shots performed significantly better. Listen. You cannot let your first shot define the rest of your shots. You cannot let something you did when you were 19 still define you when you're 59. You cannot let your first failure define you 20 years. I, I mean, guy who, he's, he is married, he's got a wonderful wife, children, serving the Lord, growing the Lord, and he feels like he has to, to preempt a conversation with me that he was divorced 20 years ago. Brother, that's under the blood of Jesus. You are redeemed from that. You are now serving Jesus. You have a wonderful marriage, wonderful children. You are honoring the church. You're honoring the Lord. Like sometime we've got to let this predefined failure go so that we no longer live under the burden of it. You can't allow your first shots to define the rest of your shots. That's John Mark. John Mark failed within the first few steps of his ministry. He didn't even make it to the first place. Yet what did he do? He did not allow that to define him. He did not allow that to become his whole identity. Listen, Jesus did not die and rise so you could fail and quit. Thank you, thank you. Jesus did not die and rise so you could fail and quit. Jesus died and rose so you could fail, be forgiven, overcome and live again for him. That's the gospel. What on earth are we celebrating next week? Redemption, reconciliation, death, burial, redemption, resurrection, renewal. We celebrate it together. Why? Because we don't have a faith of first chances. We got a faith of second chances. We got a faith of third chances. We don't have the book of Mark if we don't have someone who can fail and come back. But what does Mark show us? He shows us you cannot allow failure to define your faith. Think about this for a second. I was thinking about this the other day. Imagine Mark's walk home. Imagine Mark's walk home. He goes with Paul. He's confronted by a sorcerer. Another group threatens to kill Paul. Another one says that Paul will be dead before he makes it to Rome. And John Mark is like, I did not sign up for this. I am out of here. And by himself, he journeys back to Jerusalem a man who probably had every excuse to throw in the towel, a man who had every excuse to quit, yet what does he do? He finds a way to not allow failure to define him. And then this is what he begins to do. I I love this part of John Mark's story. John Mark didn't allow failure to stop his journeying. John Mark did not let failure stop his journeying. We've been, this is a theme that we've been walking through for the past couple of weeks, right? What did Paul in Colossians and Philemon call John Mark? Coworker, co-journeyer, co-laborer. Listen to this verse, 1 Peter 5, 13. This unlocks the entire thing that we're talking about. This gives full perspective to the redemptive journey of John Mark. Where did John Mark run back to after he left Paul and Barnabas? Jerusalem. He ran back home. He headed back home. 1 Peter 5 verse 13. Your sister church here in Babylon, the church of Babylon throughout the New Testament in Revelation 16, 17, and 18, it is always the church in Rome. It is a metaphor for the church in Rome. They're speaking of the church in Rome. So Peter says, your sister church, where? Here. Where is Peter? He's in Rome. He's at the church of Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son, Greek word pupil, Mark. What does that tell you? 
John Mark runs back to Jerusalem, to mom's house where the church is meeting. Peter is there. Peter is preaching. Peter is working. Now Peter is in Rome, and Peter is saying, from Rome, my son John Mark greets you. What does that tell you about John Mark? He journeyed again. He journeyed again. He j- Peter said, come along with me. Let's journey together. And right on the heels of his failure, he journeyed again. What have we been defining discipleship as? Eugene Peterson so brilliantly says, as followers and apprentices of Jesus, we are two things. We are disciples and we are pilgrims. We are disciples. We are learners. We, are, we learn, we grow, and then we are pilgrims. We go. We are pilgrims on a journey. Who was on a journey? Abraham was a man on a journey. Abraham went from land to land to land. What about Moses? Moses led a journey of the children of Israel from Egypt back to the promised land. The children of Israel were people who what? They journeyed. They journeyed right into trouble after trouble after trouble, consistently on a journey. The major and minor prophets were people who what? They journeyed to a land that God called them to and delivered the message from God. Jesus was a man who what? Journeyed. He journeyed from city to city. What's Paul? What what are Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and John Mark doing right now? Journeying. Journeying. They're on a journey. What does Jesus say? Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Go! Go! Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The Holy Spirit's going to empower you to be my witnesses all over the earth. In other words, we are people who are disciples, and we are journeying. And when we stop journeying, we stop growing. When you stop journeying, you stop growing spiritually because we are called to journey. This is not about sit under a sage of wisdom, collect as much Bible knowledge as you can and do nothing about it. It's not what this is. It's not what this ever was. It's a shame that that is is what it can become. But God did not save you so you could sit in church. God saved you so that you could sit, you could learn, you could disciple, you could grow, and then you could what? Go. Go! Because we're people on a journey. What do we learn from John Mark? He journeyed again. He journeyed again. He did not let failure keep him from journeying. <clears throat> My truck that I have now, it's a Dodge. Um, last one was too, right? Not bragging or anything, but um, I, I have this truck, and my previous one, it had this click button. On, you know those click button dome lights? <coughs> oh, again, they just turn on. Like, we're blessed now that they go off automatically. In my previous truck, they didn't. And so my kids at night click the dome light on. I leave it on. I wake up the next morning and my truck is what? Oh, so frustrating. So frustrating, right? Go out, press the button, and it's like, mm, does not start. Press it again, like barely makes a noise. Like my truck's dead. So I called my neighbor and I said, hey, I need you to give me a jump. My truck's dead. He's like, okay, comes over, jumps it, and I'm gonna drive it to get a new battery. So I drive to the auto parts store. I get there, I get out. I shut my door, lock it, but I leave it running, right? You can't shut it off or the thing's gonna die. And they didn't have the battery that I was looking for. So then I went back to, I called Walmart. They happened to have my battery. I'm on my way there. There's a Starbucks close by. And you know me, if it's two o'clock, I'm having coffee. Coffee. Two o'clock coffee is like a life ritual for me. Happened to be two o'clock. I placed my mobile order, pulled into like the very front. They have this 10 minute parking that this particular Starbucks is very militant about. They're like, oh, it's only 10 minutes. You're nine minutes in. You got to go in one minute, right? So I pull in and I'm there and I go in. I turn my truck off and I walk in, get my coffee. I walk back out and my truck's dead. I shut it off. I call my neighbor. I'm like, hey, I need a jump. And he goes, what do you mean you need a jump? And I said, yeah, I said, I'm I'm stuck at Starbucks. He said, did you shut it off? Listen, we cannot shut off our journey. We cannot shut, it's part of your discipleship. 
It's part of your growth. It's part of what we're called to, to journey with Jesus, to be a people that are on journey. And we journey into our neighborhood. We journey into our workspace. We journey into into the grocery. We are on a journey, always on a journey. And part of our discipleship is continuing that journey. What do we learn from John Mark? That John Mark didn't quit when he failed his first journey. John Mark didn't stop when the first journey didn't turn out as he wished. And and really quick, I think this is a good thing to to toss out there. Um, There are two types of people. There are Peters and there are Pauls. Paul was one, John Mark needed restoration, and Paul said, heck no, I'm not having anything to do with that. Peter is one who John Mark needed restoration. John Mark needed another trip, and Peter said, I'll take you with me. Let's go again. And he restored him to ministry. And then Paul, at the very end, reconciled in relationship. You have Peter's, you have Paul's, and both of them are okay. You need to hear me. Both of them are okay. I have been invited into the the restoration and journey of some people that I cannot participate in. I was a Paul. I said, there's no way. I cannot journey with you given my proximity to you and my proximity to other people and what this has done relationally. I cannot journey with you on this. I'm a Paul on this one. But there are Peters who can. And then I've been a Peter on some. I've been invited in and I've said, you know what, I can walk with you through this and I can see you through this and I can see God work. The thing is, the body of Christ needs both. And the body of Christ needs you to be both. I'm not saying you have to journey with everybody through their process of reconciliation like a Peter. If someone's deeply hurt you, deeply wounded you, comes to Christ and needs somebody to journey with them, that does not have to be your responsibility. You can be a Paul there. You can say, not my journey. I will walk in relationship with you when you're restored and Jesus bears fruit through you again, but I will not be your Peter on this one. And then you need to be a Peter. Because there are gonna be some who need that journey of restoration and you're gonna be in a place where you can lead them in that and you can walk them in that. The trick is the body of Christ needs both. Okay, rabbit trail done. Um, Let's wrap this up. Let's land this. John Mark, what's the final thing we see with John Mark? It's pretty obvious we're gonna spend the next 10 weeks studying it. John Mark did not let his first failure define his future. John Mark did not let his failed missionary journey define his future. This could be a little bit of a trick question, but just go with the guy we've been talking with. Who wrote the first gospel? Mark, thank you. Someone said Matthew, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. Like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that is, that is the order in the Bible. That's not the chronological order. Mark wrote the first gospel. Scholarly consensus is Mark's gospel informed the theological work of Matthew. It informed the expositional work of Luke, and it informed the Christological work of John. Mark was the source. Mark was the guy who wrote it. Who was Mark? He was a failure. He was a deserter. He was a runaway who somehow found a way to not allow that past to define him and went on to write a masterful work that many first century scholars believe was the most circulated gospel of its time because of the way it's written. It is bang, 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 eyewitness account after eyewitness account of how Jesus can change your life. Isn't it interesting? The guy who ran from mission now writes a gospel all about mission. He doesn't even include a genealogy. He's like, you don't need to know where Jesus came from. Here's what you need to know. Jesus changes lives. In fact, it's kind of ironic. I'll read this to you. This is Mark 1 and Mark 16, 19 through 20. This is how Mark starts his gospel, and this is how Mark finishes his gospel. He finishes it with a man on a mission to spread the gospel. Isn't that ironic? The one thing he failed at, he comes through and proclaims over the gospel. Mark 1, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written to you. Look, I'm sending my messenger. He starts that way. There's a messenger who's coming who has the message. How does he end? Mark 16, 19 through 20. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached. That's powerful. 
Talk about the redemptive nature of Mark sitting there knowing what his past was and not allowing that to define him, but using that to propel the gospel forward and say there is a messenger coming and now we become messengers. He did not allow his past to define his future. For us, ironically enough, we're here in the Loman Student Center, um, and some of you know this, how we wound up in this building, but sometimes we've got to rehearse our history. We've got to know where we came from, right? Um, and it wasn't even this building. It was the old Loman Student Center. Uh, this building wasn't even built yet, but <clears throat> when we first started the church, we, we had everything but a facility, We could not find anywhere to meet. The Loman Student Center at the time was unavailable to be rented. We went through every facility and reached out to everybody in town. Couldn't get anything. Huntsville ISD, so we're we're reaching out to the high school and we want to rent the high school. Huntsville ISD is the only school district within 13 surrounding school districts that has to have a board approval for renting a facility. All the others, the principal or the superintendent can make that decision. Huntsville ISD, it has to be a motion of the board. So I'm working with the assistant principal and we're putting together this package to rent the high school and like I'm just fired up about it. I feel really good about it. We're going to produce this much revenue. Nothing ever happens on Sunday mornings. We're going to install lights for you. We'll upgrade the sound system. Like all of this just to find our home, just to find a facility for us to rent. And so it's coming up on the agenda of the board meeting and the assistant superintendent called me and he said, hey, you need to be at this board meeting. And I said, I'm there. I even went and got a, a nice new shirt. I had it pressed at the dry cleaner. I'm all fresh and I'm like, I will show up ready to do business with God. And so I show up at this board meeting and it's the largest school board meeting of the year. Like there's usually nobody there. There was over 200 people in the room. They're giving away like teacher of the year, student of the year, and all, all these awards and all these ceremonies, right? So there's tons of people there and I'm thinking like, oh, Jesus is showing off. The church is going to be improved in front of the, approved in front of the largest crowd of the year. I'm just real excited about it. I'm, me, I'm introducing myself. Hey, I'm Luke. I'm going to pastor the church that's going to meet in here when it gets approved tonight on the board agenda, right? Like, oh, so good to meet you. So good to meet you. So I sit down. Last thing on the agenda comes up. I'm just sitting there like, yeah, come on, Jesus. Holy Spirit, fall in this place. Like, let it become our building. And the first thing that they say, is I don't think we should be in the leasing business. I was like, oh, was not expecting that. Another person chimes in. Totally agree. No way. Can't see this happening. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you know, God, we still got three more. (laughs) One of them abstains. Like, yeah, I'm not going to touch this one. I'm like, okay, now the ship's sinking. We're in big trouble. And I mean, they obliterated it. Like, totally obliterated it. It was so bad. There was a principal that was sitting of of one of the schools, a couple of seats down. He leans over to me and he says, so like, is the church still going to come to town or like, like, like that was bad, dude. Like that was like, shut you down, get out of town. We don't want you here bad. And I'm like, yeah, you know, God's, God's going to move. And I'm just devastated, like crushed. I'm telling you, it was the last opportunity. We're six months from planning a church, didn't even know where we're going to meet. It was the last opportunity we had. So I did, um, after the school board meeting, the only thing I know to do in a situation like that, I went to Taco Bell to eat my feelings. Real, real, real. real. I show up to Taco Bell, I pull in. This was like pre-COVID when you could spend $14 and get like three bags of food. <laughs> now you get like two tacos and a nacho bel grande. And I'm like, I pull in a Taco Bell and, I, and I'm nacho bel grande, that's my jam. And I'm like, might as well go big if I'm just gonna mail it all in now tonight, right? So it's like 9.30 at night. I've got my nacho bel grande. I kid you not, I'm pulling onto the feeder and this dude in a Raptor, why is it always the Raptor guys, right? Comes ripping around the corner. I mean, flying around the corner, almost runs into me. I try, I got my nacho bel grande open. I'm just about, and I'm trying to like, do you know you get that little knee work in there? You go like one hand and then knee, right? And I try to like move out of the way. And when I do, I dump my nacho bel grande on my fresh press shirt, just like straight. I didn't even get a bite of it yet. And I'm covered in nacho cheese, sour cream, and like some form of meat, right? And it's just, it's just down the front of me. And you know how you get to that place where like, it's not even like I'm going to clean this up. It's like, I don't care anymore. I mean, I'm just going to wear it. I don't care. I feel so miserable. Like, this should happen to me. I get, there's no future for me. I'm just driving. I am literally driving down the road, Nacho Bel Grande on the front of me, and I'm questioning everything. 
I'm like, I'm totally done. Totally done. What are we going to do? Maybe the principal was right. Maybe we should go to a, another town. Maybe they don't want us here. As, as I'm driving, I don't know how it happened, my phone connects to my Bluetooth, and it starts playing this Carrie Job worship song, and it's this live moment, and you can hear all of this worship happening in the background, and the, the Holy Spirit so gently spoke to my heart, if you don't give up, you will worship together in the future. If you don't give up, you'll worship together in the future. Yeah, so I did the same thing. I started crying too. You can do that. That's okay. I start crying. I've got tears running down my face, meshing with my Nacho Bograndé on the front of my shirt, creating this like soupy, nasty. I got home and Anna was like, the heck happened to you? <laughs> I got bloodshot eyes. I've been crying. I'm covered in Nacho Bograndé. And she's like, did it go good? I was like, no, it was terrible, but we're going to be okay. <laughs> Holy Spirit spoke to me through all of this. <laughs> and God's moving. <laughs> Following Monday, Frank Parker calls me. Fun Park, Frank Parker. And he says, hey, got news for you. We have a new director of the Loman Student Center and he's interested in making community partnerships. I think you should meet with him. We're the first people to lease the Loman Student Center. Church launch, yes. And, and to make it clear, like I was ready to quit, but God told me don't quit on your future. Don't quit on your future. You may feel like John Mark. You may feel like you've just walked back home to Jerusalem and you completely failed. Let John Mark, not me, let John Mark be the voice to you. Don't quit on your future. Don't allow a failure to define you. Don't allow failure to, qu to quit your journey, to stop your journey. And don't allow failure to define your future because God may just want to use you just like he did John Mark to transform the world, but you can't can't get stuck in the failure.